Good morning and welcome to River of Life. Uh, my name is Brent Hudson, pastor of River of Life Church and happy Easter. Glad that you've joined us today. Today we continue on our road to Easter and we're at our arrival point. We're going to look today at the tomb. Well, let's just jump right into our teaching time today. And before we get there, let's read from the scripture, Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee? That the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day? Then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his eleven disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. In some very important ways, many people are very much like those original disciples that first Easter morning. They're conditioned to think certain ways about life and reality. And Jesus challenged much of their thinking over that three-year period of his ministry, but it ended in disappointment and tragedy on Good Friday. Jesus was dead. The ancients were people who were very well versed in the finality of death. They saw it more often than we do today in our modern professional society. I mean, let's face it, we cart people off to specialized places to deal with death. We pay them for their services. We grieve and we try to move on with our lives as best as we can. But there is a professionalism involved. We grieve because there's a finality to death. It's the end. Just like the ancients, we know that everything that dies stays dead. I, I think that's why when Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women uh, came rushing to the room and addressed the eleven, uh, you know, and the rest of Jesus' followers who were gathered there, that Jesus had risen from the dead, they all considered it... Um, Idle tale, I think, is how the, the NL, some other translations uh, translate that. The NLT translates this as nonsense. And why wouldn't they think it's nonsense? The dead stay dead. Uh, it was so obvious that stories had been written in the ancient world about heroic adventures into Hades to rescue loved ones. And, uh, and of course, the stories always end the same. They stay dead. In, in that group, only Peter thought that the story of the women disciples warranted a look. And not only did he go investigate, but the text says that he ran to the tomb. And when he stooped down to look in, it says he was amazed at what he saw. And while Peter may not have been yet convinced that Jesus had risen from the dead, uh, at that point he saw clearly that something had happened, something amazing. J. A. T. Robinson noted many years ago that the empty tomb does not prove the resurrection, but a tomb with Jesus' body in it would certainly disprove such a resurrection. And I think that pretty much captures the mind of Peter as he saw the linen grave cloths and uh, you know the otherwise empty tomb. You know what was going on. Uh, and I have no intention today of trying to convince anyone that the resurrection of Jesus actually took place. Great books are out there. Uh, Lee Strobel wrote a book called the, uh, I think it's called The Evidence of Christ. And then there's an older book by Frank Morrison, uh, both agnostics who sought to disprove the resurrection based on historical evidence. One, a journalist, 
and the other a lawyer, both smart people. But they both came to the conclusion that the evidence is stronger um, that it actually happened. And you can read those books if you're interested in something like that. For me today, I simply want to do the more, I guess, humble task of simply imagining what was going on in Peter's mind. As the NLT says, he went home wondering what had happened. But the word that's used there for wonder, is it's not... Um, well, it's normally translated as amazed or, uh, you know, having a sense of wonder, uh, not just, you know, musing about some intellectual idea. It's that place that we enter when something doesn't compute, um, but it's something amazing. The story of Easter is amazing. And so it's my modest goal today to simply reflect on what if it's true? What if the resurrection of Jesus is true? What also becomes true in light of that? I want to mention three things that we need to rethink if the Easter story is true. And first is this. God exists. Now, I can almost hear eyes rolling as I say something so basic as that. And yeah, everyone in the ancient world pretty much believed in some kind of divine being or beings. There weren't really atheists or agnostics like there are today. Even so, uh, the Bible is quite clear about the simple fact that it was God who raised Jesus from the dead. Acts 2.24 says, God raised him up along with Romans 4.24 and, and Romans 8.11. They both say, God raised Jesus up. And the references in the New Testament go on and on. But while that much is clear, what the resurrection of Jesus shows us is not only that such a being does exist, but that uh, in a world filled with gods and idols, uh, Easter shows us which one of these divinities is the true God of gods and Lord of lords. Easter shows us that the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is the one true God. Consider John uh, chapter 17, verse 3, where Jesus says, And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you have sent to earth. Uh, Jesus makes this truth claim in his prayer, and he connects it to God being the only true God. You see, if the Easter story is true, the God of Jesus Christ is the one true God. The Father to whom he prayed and to whom he surrendered his spirit on the cross, this is the only true God. And while in our modern, you know, Western culture, it doesn't profess to have any gods uh, per se, the reality is in the biblical sense, there are gods uh, being worshipped all over the place in our culture. The God of sex, the God of physical beauty, uh, the God of fitness, the God of money, the God of leisure. You know, while it's true none of these are seen as divinities uh, by their worshipers, uh, the devotion that people have to these is equal to the ancient devotion uh, to gods. Uh, these things have become gods, basically, in the way that Paul uses the term in Philippians 3.19, where he says, They are headed for destruction. Their god is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. But Easter teaches us that God exists, and that this God has a name, and that this God has extended a covenant and seeked relationship with all those who would worship him in spirit and truth through Jesus Christ, the resurrected one. Now, the second thing I want to reflect on as we consider what if this is true is that death is defeated. Now, when I say this, I'm not discounting the distress and grief that comes when someone we love dies. The sting of death is still very, very real. And most of us have uh, felt its effects deeply in our own lives. What I'm saying by this is that, uh, well, basically, it's, an, it's a paraphrase of 2 Timothy 1.10, where it said of Jesus, he broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. You see, the Easter story points out in all caps, death is defeated. Death will not have the last word. 
uh, there's hope for those who are in Christ, and that goes beyond this life. Uh, Easter tells us that death uh, is a temporary situation. The resurrection of Jesus is called the first fruits, that pre-harvest harvest. harvest. Uh, When we look to the empty tomb and ask the question, what if this is true? We can see that Jesus shows uh, what we can expect ourselves. Um, We may well die, but that's not the end of the story. The end is resurrection. The end is the power of God, overpowering death and restoring life and creation to its proper place. Easter shows us this. But perhaps what I see as the most significant thing about the Easter story, it tells me, if it's true, uh, is that Jesus has been vindicated. People declare Jesus guilty. The court system declares him guilty. But God reverses that judgment. God vindicates Jesus, not only that he was righteous, but that he also was God's son. We're reminded of the transfiguration story where the voice comes from heaven and God says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And this leads me to my final reflection point today. If the Easter story is true, we see that Jesus' words are true. The resurrection of Jesus sets him apart from every other teacher and moral philosopher in history. Jesus becomes, I guess we could say, the apex teacher, the apex philosopher, because he is the very logos, the very mind of God in human form. Sackville, New Brunswick's own Charles Scobie, writes in his book on biblical theology, he says, the resurrection vindicates the claims of Jesus as an essential part of the Christ event. It marks the inauguration of the new order. Then Scobie goes on to quote Raymond Brown that the end has already begun because of Easter, because of the resurrection of Jesus. Theologian Thomas Oden makes this point. In Jesus' resurrection, the disciples understand themselves to be hearing the final word that history was to speak. More than this, it ratified God's approval on all that Jesus brought to the disciples in terms of his teaching, his way of life. You see, we need to remember that Jesus was crucified because of the claims that he had made about who he was. The high priest ripped his clothes and declared Jesus' words to be blasphemy, to be slander, an offense worthy of of death. New Testament scholar Daryl Bach writes, in that dispute, God's vote goes to Jesus. And so Jesus is truly and ultimately vindicated by God. Because of that, we need to understand that Jesus' words are also true. When the religious leaders said of him, he's wrong, God speaks up and says, actually, he's right. God did that in the resurrection. And then this means that when Jesus reinterpreted the Passover meal to commemorate himself, he was not some egotistical crazy person or a blasphemer, but he was the Son of God, the Christ. And it was an appropriate shift in light of the new covenant that was about to unfold. And more than this, it also means that when Jesus says, love one another and forgive those who harm you, those words carry weight. More weight than if it just a, a good religious teacher or pious moral teacher had said them. These are God's words to us. And because God knows us so well, heart and soul, these are words that are specifically honed and crafted for the unique problem that you and I have living with each other. We think of ourselves first. We prioritize what benefits our good. We're consumers of what pleases us. But what if Easter is true? What if God is real, as, just as real as the fresh air of spring? What if, what if death and sin are tragic, but yet temporary setbacks of our existence? What if the world's definition of taking care of number one is actually all wrong and upside down, and being a good and faithful servant of God a servant on the way to hearing those words, well done, is actually about building others up according to their needs. What if it's putting what we want on the back burner just a little bit longer? What if it included listening to each other, really listening like Jesus did? 
Charles Scobie makes a very important point about the empty tomb. He says, in the Gospels, the women and the disciples do not believe in Christ's resurrection because of the empty tomb. They believe because of their encounter with the risen Christ. You know, with all the differences between our time and the time of Jesus, this one remains the same. People are not changed by facts about the empty tomb. People's lives are changed when they encounter the risen Christ. And on this Sunday morning, people are still encountering the risen Jesus. People are still experiencing his power at work in their lives to change, to love, to forgive, to break free. Whether you've believed for years or only just begun, or perhaps you've yet to take that first step, the truth of the resurrection brings with it an opportunity to experience the risen Christ every single day. An experience that ultimately will change our lives for the better. Pray with me. God, we ask that you would be with us on this Easter Sunday. We have our doubts, we have our questions, we have all those things that just compound in our lives. But Lord, as we look to the empty tomb, uh, may we be like Peter and, and be full of wonder about what you have done. And then, Lord, as we continue reading in the New Testament about how Jesus appeared to first the disciples and then to many, help us to be, Lord, a people who have faith. Faith to believe that with you nothing is impossible, that this life is not the end, and that we truly have a hope that is anchored in this historical truth that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Help us to be a people of faith a people who are transformed by our encounter with the living Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us here this Easter morning at River of Life. We will be back again in seven days. And until then, may God bless you. Relevant, practical, authentic. River of Life.